uh, we will just get this going. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Welcome to Inside the 18. I'm Michael Majid, live from Hollywood, California. With me, you know her as 99 World Cup winner, Suskia Weber. And joining us, guys, we have a very special guest today on the panel. We have Everton and England goalkeeper, Sandy McK McKeever. Did I say it right? McKeever? Yeah, you did. Yeah, I did. I love it. I love it. How many people say McIver? I bet you everyone says Too McIver. Too many. Too many. <laughs> Too many uh, uh, joining us. Uh, guys, I I'm really excited about this, guys. Uh, we're going to be talking today about dealing with isolation as we were just kind of talking about the fact that sometimes games can be a little lopsided and uh, goalkeepers, especially <laughs> goalkeepers, can, uh, can go all over the place right now. And if I seem a little frazzled right now, guys, um, Suskia, uh, just, uh, just oh, to no. give you a heads up. Yep. I'm starting to have uh, pains on the right side again. I don't think it's a kidney stone. Um, I think I might have some inflammation. So what is up with this time of year and me and medical issues? I, I don't know. I don't know where to go with this. I don't have answers for you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. I hope it's not a kidney stone, though. Oh, I, re I really hope it's not a kidney stone. <laughs> well, I hope it's if it's a kidney. I'd rather it's a kidney stone than anything more serious. And I'm a total yes, hypochondriac, Sandy. So, like, I just assume the worst. Like, I will just be like... You know, like I'm, I'm feeling, you know, something's bruised and I'm like, well, I'm assuming that I need surgery. Um, so <laughs> my career was short lived, um, but somebody <laughs> whose career was not short lived uh, is is Sandy right here. I'm um, kind of before we kind of get into this, uh, Sandy, uh, for some people kind of who aren't familiar with your journey, um, you actually had a really fascinating path. Obviously, you know, you grew up in the UK, but you decided to go to university here in the United States at Clemson. Yeah, um, I think that was a very quick well, more of a last minute decision from myself. Um, I think I ended up going in the summer of 2016. I only visited in the April prior to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, you guys both know what, what college like is in the States, but I mean, for me, it was a surreal experience. And um, I mean, three and a half years that, that I'll never forget. You know, and, and, and it, it's, it's funny that you bring that up and stuff because, you know, obviously Suskia is at UCLA, which is it attracts a lot of international players. And, and, and I think a lot of people, you know, say that, Suskia, you know, when they come here, they, the, the facilities we have here in regards to the university game and the professionalism of our of our college system really is, is second to none outside of the world, outside of the professional game. Yeah, I mean, yeah. especially going to a school like Clemson. I mean, um, the facilities, I'm sure, were above and beyond. Um, same here at UCLA and everything. And it is it is for some people coming in to see the level of professionalism. It's it's pretty impressive. Even for me, to be honest with you, from you know, last time I was at college, I was playing in college. So um, so to come in and see like like my first day out at practice at UCLA, I had like two assistants. My balls were set up like. The field was immaculate. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> Just that alone was amazing to me. <laughs> like... <laughs> and, and by the way, Sandy, feel free to step in anytime. You don't have to wait for her to answer a question or any, anything like that. But like, um, I, I think, you know, one of the, the cool things that you, you said that, so, what is going on? Is there a, uh, is this the gardener? Every time, on? every time I sign on, the gardeners know it and they, they show up. But hold this on is... and I'll close that one window. Maybe that'll help. Okay. Oh my God! That, talk, that talk is, amongst uh, yourselves. All right, all right, we'll talk amongst <laughs> ourselves. We're talking amongst ourselves. Um, Sandy, what was what was it that kind of like made you make that decision to go to university here? Like, was there a lot of pressure for you to to stay, you know, out there saying, "Oh, well, you know, you, if you want to play in the professional game here in the WSL, like you're going to have to stay in the academy system as opposed to to go overseas"? Or were people pretty encouraging of it? Um, to be honest, no, not not terribly encouraging. Um, I think I think now girls in the UK going over to America, I think I think the path for them is probably a little more welcoming. Um, I mean, at the time, I think I was in the under 19s with England, and uh, I remember the coach saying, you know, if you go over there, 
there's no guarantee you'll get picked for for camps. And I mean, looking back now, I mean, as a fortunate as a senior international, I mean, the U17s, U19s, you know, it's only a small part of your journey. But back then, that was that was everything. Um, you know, to go to European Championships and World Cups at that age, I mean, that is that's huge. Um, so it was a difficult decision because I probably didn't have. I probably wasn't fully supported by coaches in England, but for me, getting my degree was just as important as the as the football was. So I think that ultimately was what what pushed me over the edge to go. Yeah, you know, I, I love what you say that because that's something that Suskia, you know, stresses to a, a lot of players, and not just international players, but domestic players as well too. Is that you know you get having this opportunity to be able to play at a high level and be able to finish off your education is something that you really, I mean, it's really hard to replicate. It's really hard to replicate that. Right. Susk. Sorry. Yeah. I was That's all good. asking yeah. the gardeners to stop. So go ahead. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Repeat the question. <laughs> I was just saying we were, cause Sandy was just talking about the fact that like, you know, she, people weren't that encouraging at the time of her coming over here to, to go to university, but for her getting that education and getting that degree, while still pursuing her professional career, you know, was kind of the selling point for her. And I think that's something that you all have stressed at a school like UCLA. Well, yeah. And you have to remember something. I think a good example is the the Latvian team, um, all the girls still having to work. You know, they're, you know, if you're privileged enough to play, play pro after, after school, that's great. And, but you know, with the salary, salary wise and stuff like that, this isn't your lifelong thing. You're not going to retire a multimillionaire. Um, and everything. And so I think, I think an education is huge and, um, you know, spending for, and especially because our system is so good, um, that it's not a, it's not a major drop in my opinion. You know, it's, you know, you got a lot of, you got some kids that are coming now coming out of high school and trying to go pro right away and oh, I'll go back to college, which kind of never happens. And, and I think that having the, having the ability to number one, play in the ACC, play for a school like Clemson, get an incredible education and still play pro after, um, I think it's huge. And, and for coaches to discourage that, that always bothers me. Yeah. It's very, it's just very different than men's sports. You, you know, (laughs) it is. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I mean, even now when people ask me, like the first thing I say to them is, do you want to go, um, to university? So I understand for, for some people that's not, that, that doesn't suit them. That's not potentially the right decision for them. But I think anybody who that does interest 100% at least look at going to the US because I before that I was, I like got offered a contract at Manchester City when I think I was about 17 or when I was going to turn 18. And I was looking at going to university um, in Manchester. But because like the football club and the university aren't affiliated, that was just going to be so difficult to balance. I mean, I've had friends here now who I play with who have gone to university and dropped out after the first year because the demands to complete a degree alongside playing professional football when ne- like neither the football team or the university are, are working together, whereas right, I mean, like yeah. in America, it's built. Yeah, like, the system is built for that. It's it is built for that, and that's the thing. Like come spring season. You know, they're only allowed to train a certain amount of hours a day. And that includes like weights and whatever. So, you know, it's a very light schedule, even though, you know, you'll have scrimmages and spring games and stuff. But it's built around success in, in both sport and in, in school. Um, and then in the fall, even though we're traveling and everything like that, it's still hand in hand. The, the professors, the university works with the team to make sure they're going to – their um testing and everything like that. But if you had to do two totally opposite things and they don't work together, that's impossible. Yeah. And, and I, and I think that's, that's a wonderful point, Suskia, that, you, that you're bringing up right there. You know, like Sandy, I, I, I think, you know, one of the great things is as well too, is us as goalkeepers personally, our development does take a while to mature from a, from a reading the game standpoint, from a decision-making standpoint, and maybe, you know, even just, you know, even from a technical standpoint. So it's like, to take that time and go to university, I think it is for 
people who say, oh, well, you know, you need to get into the professional environment as soon as possible, as soon as possible. Well, chances are as a goalkeeper, you're not going to be playing as a number one in the professional environment until you get a little bit older anyway. So you may as well take this time. Is that kind of something that was running around your mind too? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it is hard. It is hard as a young goalkeeper getting experience because it's probably one more, well, the only position, maybe a centre-back as well, where a coach, a manager is is looking to rely on experience more than probably mm-hmm. talent. Um, so, yeah, no, I'd agree with what you say there. Yeah. So, so how, so how did you kind of get, kind of come back into? So, after you finished off college, did you, did you think about staying here and 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 and, and trying to give NWSL a shot, or or did you know immediately you wanted to go back and, and try to try to get into the WSL? Um, I definitely thought about the draft. Um, I mean, my goalkeeper coach at Clemson did speak to me about it. Um, but yeah, I, I think. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think coming back to England was probably, um, I think it was probably always going to happen. Uh, I think just because, like, wanting to break back into or break into the England senior side, um, I thought it was probably going to be more of a chance playing in England where you're in front of the coaches, you know, week in, week out. That was probably one of the difficult things whilst I was in Clemson because you know, you're not in people's faces. It is harder to to make yourself known when, you know, you're playing up across the pond. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like I'm playing the NWSL does interest me. Um, you know, to be honest, like playing in Europe does interest me as well. So maybe one day. I think that's the cool – I think that's such a great thing about everything now is the options. And um, – being able to come here, go to university, then know that the the pro leagues there in England to play in or go to Europe and everything. And even talking to players now that like, okay, like me officials coming out early and she'll go into the draft, um, you know, but the options there are overwhelming. Like it's okay. You don't just have to go into the WSA, um, WSA you don't have to, NWSL, sorry. Um, that's old school there. Um, you don't just have to go into that. You can look to go to England. You can look other places. And so that just opens up so many other options and I think also allows you to get your degree. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I and I think that's that's a great point right there. Now, now, Sandy, you were talking about obviously the England side and everything like that. And it was it did, were they kind of keeping track of you, like for the pool, for the youth pools, and everything like that, while you were in the U.S.? Or did you go like, you know what, I'm willing to make that sacrifice of getting out of the youth setup in order to come here to the university, and then I'll be I'll become a better goalkeeper, and then I'll be able to come back and challenge, you know, once I yeah. come back. Yeah, I mean that's a... sorry, that's <laughs> exactly it. Um, I remember when I in going into my freshman year, I decided if I don't. Well, my goal going to Clemson was if I could get picked to the under 23s, which, which existed at the time, you know, that's my goal. I mean, if I don't get picked for the under 19s, freshman year, sophomore year, it's not the be all and end all. Um, No, I think it was just after the under 20s world cup, I think it was going into my junior year or senior year. I got um, my first senior call up, but I think at the time, I thought we were playing ACC conference or NCAAs had started, so um, I didn't end up going. But, yeah, I mean, I think junior, senior year, I think my name was starting to get thrown about a bit. Um, And then, luckily enough, I think my senior year, I got another call up and I was able to go. I mean, well, well, I mean, congratulations on that. I mean, it seems like, you know, England's future is really secure. I mean, in regards to like, I mean, there's you, Hannah, Ellie, like there's so many young, fantastic goalkeepers, you know, coming through the system there, you know, I mean, and just shout out to everything the FA is doing, you know, with all you, all, all of you all, because it, I mean, I watch the videos, I see, I see the sessions and stuff like that. And it's like, it seems like a great environment and they're, they're really, you know, it's a competitive environment. You guys are all pushing each other, but I mean, all three of you guys just had such fantastic futures. We're just really ex- excited about it, you know, and then, you know, um, hopefully uh, some of you guys decide to come to the NWSL so we can see you guys in person. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think there's a year between um, me and Ellie. I think there's another year between Ellie and Hannah. So we're all very close in age. And I mean, I don't I don't know the strength and depth in, across the other nations, but 
you know, I'd arguably say we've probably got one of the strongest goalkeeping departments, you know, internationally. Um, but like, I mean, not only that, I mean, if you look at the England team now, um, you know, you've got the likes of Alessi Russo, a lot of them more like they've both played in the ACC at UNC, um, you know, Anna Patton at Arsenal, she's in the U23s, you know, she used at FSU. And um, like, I think if you look at the players, certainly around my age and the year below who have come over to America, I mean, I think that just speaks volumes for the system um, and the quality of, of the system. I, I feel like I feel like this is like a like an infomercial for the for 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 NCAA women's soccer, like the way we've been, <laughs> been, been doing it. I feel like they're going to come over and they're going to like for take the a AC, from this. for the ACC yeah, for the right? ACC. Yeah, just, <laughs> and like afterwards, there's just going to be like a wipe, like a wipe, and says like the ACC. Like listen to Sandy. The ACC. Listen, the eighteen brought to you by the ACC. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And just like an ACC representative, like hands us a big bag of money. Um, that, would be, <laughs> that'd be <good. laughs> that would be amazing. Um, let's uh, let's kind of delve into this topic uh, right now, guys. And like I said, uh, today's topic is kind of dealing with uh, with isolation. <laughs> Sandy, this is something that you brought up. And uh, it's actually something that I, I had I had thought about, you know, a, a while back in the past. And, you know, obviously, you know, you're talking about, you know, matches like 20 to nothing and things like that. And obviously that's that's surreal. And there's also, you know, a lot of one nil matches can also have moments of isolation. So um, kind of in your words, like kind of what do we mean by isolation? Um, I think it can mean a couple of things. I mean, firstly, you know, you play a 90 minute game, you might go several periods of five minutes and you're not touching the ball, even 10 minutes maybe. And it's, I think it's so important to, you know, make sure you're staying engaged because I mean, to me, you know, I've played teams like Chelsea and Arsenal, um, you know, top teams in Europe and you're constantly getting things to do. And I, that's almost easier to deal with than probably a weaker team where you're not seeing the ball much. And I think, you know, probably being isolated in terms of that, you know, how are you staying engaged? Um, but also in terms of, I think, the goalkeeping position itself. I mean, a lot of the time you're spending doing separate training from the team. Uh, you know, how are you building those relationships, especially with your defenders? You know, so when you are playing at the weekend, you know, you're not, you're not a complete separate entity to the team. I mean, yes, we can use our hands, but, you know, it's 11 players on the pitch, so... Um, you know, I do think it's really important not to isolate a goalkeeper in um, in those terms as well. I, I love what you just said right there because this is something Suskia is so massive on. She's a massive proponent of the fact is that we need to integrate the goalkeeper not just from a from a tactical manner, but from a social manner, especially at the youth levels, because so many times this poor young goalkeeper is left kind of on on the wayside and they they do feel like an outcast they do feel less of a, of a member of the team and you know Suske, i know you've spent some time in the youth game as well and obviously in the college game it's a little bit different because there is that that community at the university you know but um if there's anything you want to add to that so well i think that falls on the coach really and setting up an environment that that integrates the goalkeeper you know if you're a coach of the youth game and you don't know anything about goalkeeping and your mentality is okay you guys go over in the corner you know, kick the ball back and forth and we'll call you over when you're ready. And you see it all the time. Like if you're sitting there watching like clubs and watching whatever, and they're two young little goalkeepers that are doing whatever. I don't even know. Sometimes I just sit there. I'm like, what are they doing? Like <laughs> they'll throw it. They'll like hit some volleys that go everywhere and they have no structure. And I think that um, it comes from the top down. You need to set up structure. You, you need to take the time to whether set up a proper warm up so the goalkeepers have A, B, and C to do. If, if you don't have the if you don't have a goalkeeper coach or an assistant to help, and then your your practices and everything need to also integrate the goalkeeper. And I don't mean like 11, 11 and the goalkeeper's just standing back there staring at the clouds. I mean like small sided, um, you know going to goal, building out of the back, like, you know, Sandy said, it's got to be that that player has to be played in because you can't just expect them to turn it on all of a sudden in a game. Uh, I'm, yeah. And I'm talking mostly about youth, you know, youth of, kids, of oh, you know, why, why aren't you, why don't you have a connection with your backs? Why are you doing this when we're doing that? Because that's on you. That's, that's on the coach and not playing that player in. Yeah. That's, um, I mean, like all the time, um, you know, the past year and a half been in England, that's something that I've been pushing for is being involved in possession drills mm. or, 
you know, things like that where you're incorporating your feet, especially if the manager wants a style of play which involves the keeper, which I've been in teams that do. You know, as you say, you can't just expect a goalkeeper to turn up at the weekend and play, not necessarily under pressure, but, you know, you're going to have people closing you down. You know, you need to, you know, practice in situations like that. Yeah, they have to be, they have to be incorporated. And you know how I am with keepers and rondos. And everything. They, there's no reason that your goalkeeper shouldn't be counted in your rondos um, using their feet because they have to play under pressure and they need to be comfortable. And I always say the other players need to be comfortable with the goalkeeper as well. So, you know, if you're in rondos with them or um, doing stuff under pressure and you know you have the confidence to pass it to the keeper and she can one touch it or two touch it to the right space and you do that in practice, you're going to do it in a game. Yeah. You know, and, and I think you just brought up a really good point right there, Suski, in regards to the fact that like if you feel comfortable with the goalkeeper, if you incorporate the goalkeeper, if you, you socialize the goalkeeper and everything like that, it's going to be much easier for them to stay engaged in the game mm -hmm. because the other team is going to be focusing on them more. Your team is going to be focusing on on you more as opposed to just kind of like. Oh, oh yeah, that person's still back there. I forgot about that. Well, I don't well, really want to play that. And you want to feel person. comfortable playing through them. There's no reason that you can't play through. There's no reason that at a lot of times that your center back should be getting the ball to play through and switch sides when you can use the keeper. And, you know, and but that comes from the coach and it comes from practice. Yeah. Um, right here, actually, um, there's actually a really good question right here, you know, Sandy uh, from Andreas. And he goes, uh, do you stay more engaged by self-talk or external dialogue? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah. For me, both. Um, the new <laughs> England coach is actually – implemented this this term called rest defense so it's all about when your team is out of possession um you know in there in the attacking half how how are we prepared if we lose possession if there's going to be a counter-attack are our centre-backs locked on um you know are we all dialed in so that i think that's one a great way of external dialogue for keepers i mean is everybody where they should be you know mm -hmm. um, we're not just kind of ball watching, ball watching, and suddenly a 40, 50 year old ball's come into our half and we're on the back foot. Um, but also with, with self talk, I mean, for me, sometimes, you know, if we're making a substitution or, you know, a player's down injured, I'll go through my head things that I need to refresh my mind. You know, little things like making sure if there's a shot, I'm watching the ball, or for me, um, any dipping balls any low balls that I've got my head forward and um you know my hands are behind the ball so sometimes in a game I'll be mimicking those actions um so yeah I mean off that question for me both yeah, yeah it, and that's exactly right that's a perfect way to stay engaged in a sense to keep yourself um if you you should absolutely and I say this all the time be organizing your d while you know, while that we're in the attacking third so that you're right. If there's a 50 yard ball, you're not on the back foot. And if the, we're not talking about major organization, you're just kind of keeping the people aware, tucking them in where they should be, um, keeping them di dialed in as well. So they're not ball watching um, and being ready just to keep that ball on the other end. So I think that's 1000% correct. <laughs> Yeah. Now, Cindy, I've, I've got a question for you right here, because, you know, I think one of the, the tough things for a lot of young goalkeepers in regards to when they're in moments of inactivity and, and, and in isolation and everything like that is that it's hard for them to read certain triggers or cues that they should look for in order to kind of snap into action, quote unquote. You know, like what, what are some certain triggers that, that you, you know, find, you know, when when your team's, you know, up in the attacking third that you're kind of looking out for to make sure that you are you are connected and that you are ready? Um, I mean, first of my starting position, um, you know, at Everton we've just got a new manager and he's very big on um, <coughs> you know, the goalkeeper's starting position in relation to the back four. So firstly, you know, I'm looking where am I? You know, if we're attacking and, you know, we're kind of really pushed up in their half, if I'm stood in my 18-yard box, it's it's not it's not going to be very effective if a through ball comes over the top. So firstly, my starting position. Um, secondly, you know, like I just said about where what the position of our centre backs. Where's their centre forward? You know, have we got one in front, one behind? You know, depending on the situation. <laughs> um, and then 
the other thing, especially if it's cold, which in England it quite often is, you know, I'm keeping my body warm, um, mm-hmm. especially if you're standing there for five, ten minutes, you don't want to get cold. Um, so, I mean, you'll see me a lot of the time just running across, running across the pitch, just trying to keep myself warm yeah. and, and staying dialed in. I mean, I mean, I think uh, the cold thing, I mean, yeah, well, uh, you know, for, fortunately, we don't have to deal with that too much here in Southern California. Uh, you guess so that. <laughs> Sometimes you just don't bring it up. My... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you say I'm going to jinx it. You say it's all of a sudden. Gonna no, be like I'm just degrees. saying we don't you don't want to rub it in people's faces. That is eight, 70 degrees right now. So. <laughs> you know, um, you, you know, and I, I think, you know, one one thing, you know, Suskin, in, in regards to that, too, is that, you know, and, and Phil Wedden brought this up last week, you know, um, when he was on the podcast, the director of goalkeeping at Philadelphia Union, is he said, you know, goalkeepers also have to recognize the difference between defending areas and defending the goal and when you're defending area and when you're defending goal. And a lot of times when you're talking about being in isolation, you know, and 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 balls being, you know, higher up the field and everything like that, it's much more about understanding how to defend specific areas so that a defending the goal situation doesn't come up. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you like, you want to be able to close that space for the through ball. If you're stuck flat footed in your 18 and you're totally disconnected from your back line and then, then you're defending the goal and you're not defending what could like, you're not on your front foot. You're not ready to come through, clean up anything that gets dumped into kind of no man's land and everything. If you're, if you're too deep, if you're not dialed in, then that that split, you know, I always say that split second of are you reading, are you anticipating, are you seeing, are you problem solving so that you don't have to defend the goal, or are you standing there flat footed and then all of a sudden go oh, and then and then reacting, and if you do that, you're already second behind. Yeah, you know, you know, one thing I've noticed, Sandy, and I don't know if you you know you you notice this at the, the younger ages, you know, when you were coming through the youth you, you know youth system or anything like that, you know, is that a lot of times a lot of goalkeepers feel isolated when it comes to the team dynamic in regards to uh, halftime, you know, pregame, postgame, that sort of a thing. Because a lot of times, the, the you know, the, the head coaches, the head managers and everything like that are, are focusing on the outfield players and they're focusing on giving instruction to the outfield players. And they kind of feel like they're just kind of there, but they're not not there. Um, do you have any advice for like any young goalkeepers who are feeling like this? Is this a, they need to communicate to their coaches that they, they feel left out or, or what do you, what do you think? Um, for me, I mean, whenever a situation like that or, you know, anything in relation to the team, I mean, my first point of call is my goalkeeper coach, you know, um, this season, for example, you know, when I've wanted to be in more possession-based drills or, or things that use off feet, you know, I'll go through my goalkeeper coach, you know, he has a good relationship with the manager. Um, so I think anytime you do feel a bit isolated, I mean, especially things like half time, you know, yeah, rarely is it that the keeper is brought up. And so in the past, it's always been, you know, the goalkeeper coach has come over and spoken to you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think with anything really, you know, your goalkeeper coach, you know, hopefully you've got a good relationship with them and, you know, any queries, you know, go through them and, and they, I'm sure, you know, they'll either speak to the manager or, you know, just say how, you know, how the manager likes to do things might not necessarily always include the goalkeeper, but, you know, I'm sure they'll always make a conscious effort to, to um, you know, show the keepers more, more interest, if you like. Yeah. So, so ask anything, any, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I'm the same way. The first thing I do at half or anything is like, I'll go and talk with Lauren about that first half and everything. I think that um, as a coach, if you're, if you're discussing stuff at halftime and you're discussing like a defensive breakdown, or if you're discussing anything, there is no reason that the goalkeeper is not incorporated in that conversation. Like, you should be talking about, hey, what, you know, if it's, you know, there was a breakdown here or this went well, like, what was the communication here? Did, what did you see? You know, Saskia, what did you see while you were in there and everything? Like, to negate the goalkeeper as coaches out there and just be like, you know, the center back did this and this, and that. they're tied in. It's your job to tie them in as well. So I think you just brought up a great point, Susk, in regards to the fact is that, like, for a lot of, a lot of young coaches out there listening who are outfield coaches, is that, if you don't, if you leave your goalkeeper coach on an island, it's going to be very difficult for them 
to be able to assist the goalkeeper, you know, during, during these moments and everything like that, because, you know, you're not giving them information. You're not asking for, for questions from their, their side so that you might have a different perspective or a different point of view of it because, and, and so it's all synergy. It's all synergy between Mm -hmm. the players and all the coaching staff, you know? And I think that's something I think Sandy, that I think you guys do really well, you know, especially with the FA. Yeah. Um, I think I remember the first, I think one of the first senior camps I went to, you know, I think there was a, a couple of us from the youth, youth teams that had gone up together and, um, you know, asking, you know, how was training, how was this? And I thought, do you know what? The keepers, oh, the keepers are, are so lovely. Um, you know, got to know the keepers so well. And then it's like, I actually had very little relationship with the outfield players because I had no contact with them. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the coaches I've had at England, um, you know, they've all had good relationships with the managers and I've had good relationships with them. And, you know, especially in an environment like that, the more you get comfortable, you know, you're, you're um, more confident, you know, asking those sorts of questions. And um, yeah. No. Yeah. I um, think my first camp, like back in the stone ages, <laughs> When I went in, I remember like, you know, being in our meetings and stuff and talking about situations and, and being incorporated like Saskia, what is your what is your communication here? What are you looking for first? And being able to verbalize that with the team there and saying, OK, I have to drop, you know, Lil back on the outside, pinch in here, you know, pressure on the ball, cup, pressure, cup about make sure and knowing that and them hearing me say that. So when it translates onto the field and I'm calling for that this is something we've discussed already. And that's what I'm talking about co- coaches out there that are field coaches. You have to incorporate your goalkeepers in those discussions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even at, at England now, I mean, the coaches, you know, the outfield coaches are, are, are discussing with the keepers, you know, what they want from them. Mm-hmm. I mean, the women's game now, especially, I mean, you know, playing with your feet is such a big part of it. Um, but, you know, not only that, I mean, for example, I mean, last camp, one of the coaches was, you know, spoke to the goalkeepers about, you know, the communication. You know, they felt that the communi- like the way we were communicating as goalkeepers was, um, you know, was, I think a bit too rash in how we were, were saying things, you know. So what does to calm it down, you know, you know, little things like that, you know, you're not you're not a forgotten member of the team, and yeah, yeah I mean, as you say, Michael, I, I do think the the coaches in England do are, are more are more conscious than they were before about you know what they want from the keeper and actually communicating that with them. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I want to do this right now. I want to pull up uh, some clips of Sandy, and uh, and okay. uh, and I want to kind of show these kind of moments and everything like that. You know, in regards to you know being kind of called into action after kind of being in isolation. Whoops, hold on, let me uh pause that and turn off the volume here so this is against leicester city and uh, i'm sure sandy will be able to uh, attest Sandy's to this not there. oh wait what happened to sandy no I'm back. <laughs> you're back you're back <laughs> i thought she was like so upset she's like wait i don't want to see <laughs> I, 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 I didn't say i'd do this for that <laughs> <laughs> um but basically what happens here it's against leicester and uh Balls are balls played from the attacking third and it bypasses kind of the entire line. You kind of recognize the cue that the ball's going over the top. You move high to come in and reset to build. Um, so let's kind of play this here. Balls played over the top. You recognize that. Boom. Um, I want to start again kind of right here. So as the ball is kind of in that attacking third right here, where's the, what's, the, what's kind of like the cue that you're seeing right now, Sandy, that's kind of making you decide, okay, I need to come up high. Um, the opposition, um, the position of the opposition where they are. Um, I mean, as soon as as last girl hits it, I mean, you can judge the flight and the speed of the ball, um, and then also like where our centre backs are. I mean, because I'm um, I'm quite big on let defenders defend. I mean, that's one thing that has been instilled in us, you know, well instilled in me ever since I've been a goalkeeper. You know, you don't want to cause a car crash. Um, but I mean, our defender you've seen there has gone to challenge the ball, and then our left centre back and, and right back. The distance between them is wide enough where it's going to be quicker and easier for me to get the ball, rather than wait for one of them to get back. And um, since our new manager's come in, actually, you know, because he's 
he's big on goalkeeper front foot positioning. You know, if you watch our left centre back Gabby there, he and one thing he's instilled in us is if the ball is coming through to the keeper, how quickly can the centre backs get wide and support you? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think this was the first game we'd actually worked on it. So Sue, you know, she's giving me an angle rather than sometimes you'll see a centre back, they're running back to you and think, oh, the keeper's going to get it. And they're not thinking what's next. Right. Whereas that's, and that's been, you know, the last few weeks we've been working on is, okay, the ball is going back to the goalkeeper. You've got to give her an option, you know, before she's received the ball. And then I love right here, just you know, right after the touch, the touch is now you're now you get into some support supporting space as she challenges in that space right right there. I mean, this is just great work all around. I mean, shout out to you guys all over there. I mean, um, Suske, any thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, I think that for young, I keep going back to younger um, coaches and players out there. Like, I think, you know, on the younger level and stuff. A lot of a lot of coaches want their center back. They don't want their keeper having the ball, right? They don't trust their keeper with their feet, whatever for whatever reasons that we've talked about, which is, you know, that's your fault for not playing them in and stuff. But if you allow the center back to come back and take this, which is what I was talking about earlier, because you're too deep in the 18. Now the other team's gonna know that and they're gonna start pressing. Now they're gonna pull up. Her back is to them. Like it changes the entire dynamic of this situation. Like the other, you know, the it's against Lester, right? The other um the Lester forwards could come up and press, and now she now she's in trouble. Yeah, now you're in a strange position for her to play it back to you, and it changes all this. But by saying no and eating up this space, being on your front put, foot, getting played in, your your back's dropping out wide to give you support. The whole situation's controlled, and now you're on the front foot. You 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 know, and it's your ball, and you guys are going up the other end. And I think that you know that is exactly what we're saying about like, are you? protecting the goal or are you looking at the situations and the space behind where you can come up and take the responsibility that younger coaches put on their center back for whatever reason. Um, so this is about goalkeepers being played in, not isolated back there. Not like, okay, well, you know, Jen's got the ball, Jen's got the best feet so let her come get it. No, you know? Yeah. I want to, I want to move on to this, uh, this next clip. Cause this is a different scenario right here. I think this might be against Lester as well too, right here, Sandy. But I think what happens here is the outside back is getting chased, uh, a little inside midfield Th they pivot to retreat. And because of that, you kind of recognize that cue when to pivot. And that's when you kind of dr immediately show to support to begin another build right there. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think I want a lot of young goalkeepers to watch these types of plays because these aren't the flashy, exciting top hand type of saves, but these are the types of things that are going to get you noticed, you know, at the higher, at the higher levels. So let's kind of walk through kind of, again, kind of what's happening right here. And Sandy, if you can kind of take us through kind of your mindset. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, as you say, um, Gabby, I'll play there has got a back to play. I mean, Again, just going back to how in how is the coach making the goalkeeper involved? I mean, if the coach does not does not um, you know give the impression that we want our keeper off the, the ball, Gabby might try and turn that player and then play back down the side, you know, or she might try and take an unnecessary risk, you know, and then she might get pickpocketed and and we're three one v one. Um, so I do feel quite lucky in that in that aspect to Everton that we are quite involved. Um, yeah, and here, I mean, we we talk about depth of start and position in, in two different ways. I mean, I could, one, drop quite deep, give myself time, um, you know, closer to my goal, um, or I can come quite wide. And I think in this instance, you know, I've, I've chose to stay relatively high, but quite wide, because then it puts, I mean, I don't know if she, the striker's still coming, but it kind of puts her off that run. You know, maybe if I'm quite deep, I might cut off the angle, you know, I might cut off the angle to the other centre back and and the striker keeps closing me down. But I think for me, that is a big thing. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't always get it right, but um, you know, do I want to be deep or am I creating do I want to stay high and create a wide angle? You know, and I'm gonna say something else from a from a offensive point of view. You know, we know if the goalkeeper and if the team is comfortable playing through that goalkeeper. And, you know, we play against plenty of teams that we are well aware that the goalkeeper is not that confident with their feet. It's obvious that the team doesn't play through her much. So let's say hypothetically this was that case, then that that forward would be triggered to go. 
go, put the pressure on. But watch her immediately drop off right when she passes the ball because she has she knows that you're confident with your feet. You know what I'm saying? Like it'd be like somebody like going after Lauren. It's like you're just wasting your run. Go ahead, waste your run, tire yourself out. But you know, and so those are things that the other team knows, you know, and and you know, they if they if you weren't used to playing your keeper in, we pressure this. And force it, force a mistake. Exactly. Because if they did pressure, if they did pressure right there, if they did try to try to chase and come at you, well, now they're just opening up gobs of space for you to counter, you know, mm -hmm. and you can, you know, and as opposed to you going short right there, you go long because they're just opening up the space for you, you know? So, um, yeah. I think overall, just overall around, I, I just, you know, I love watching a lot of these scenarios and I love, you know, YouTube breaking these down and everything like that, because again, we're talking about, you know, handling isolation, but recognizing the fact that there is really no such thing as isolation. I want a lot of young goalkeepers to hear that, that you need to stay engaged throughout the entire game even if you're not physically active your starting position is going to be changing you know if you're following the game you're moving with the game because you're you're putting yourself in the best position to defend those areas like we're kind of talking about here um yeah, when I was at, sorry Michael, no go ahead go ahead I was gonna say, when i was at clemson um my coach eddie uh, i remember him saying to uh to me or any other goalkeepers he said there's no guarantee. I mean, it's probably not likely that after a 90 minute game, you're going to be physically exhausted, but by the end of that 90 minute game, you will be mentally exhausted, you know, because yep. you haven't concentrate the whole time, you know, you can't switch off and, you know, unless me, you're that's... Latvian keeper. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, if you've not, if you've not got anything to do or you've not got much to do, I mean, there are times like I'll come off the pitch and as you know, I'm not running seven, eight, nine, ten 10 kilometers, but, you know, I'll have you're, a good sleep exhausted. that night because I've, you know, yeah. you've got to stay dialed in. And here's the thing. Bottom line is one of the biggest compliments you can give like an elite goalkeeper and on good teams is that they are making that last minute, that save in the 90th minute. And it's because, and to, to be able to make that save means you have to be dialed in for the whole 89. And, and cause that's going to come up and, it, you know, back in the day, like even with the U S team, um, there, a lot of times there's not a lot to do. You know, and so the worst thing in the world would be um, it'd be like five to one, you know, and the other team scored in the 90th minute. You know, maybe it's a banger, maybe it isn't. But at the same point, was I was I not focused? Was I, you know, I have no saves and one goal against. Was I not like dialed in the entire game? And it's really, you know, that's that is the difference at a certain level between goalkeepers. And, yeah, and I look for it, you know. Yeah, I think in uh, COVID, you know, I think we had about three or four months off between the end of the season and, and pre-season. And so that was one thing that I really focused on was how, you know, because I'd, I'd have training sessions where, you know, let's say we've got 40 minutes with the goalkeepers, you know, the first 25 minutes, I'll be really good. And then the last 15 minutes, you know, just getting a bit sloppy, you know, dropping the ball. And, and for me, that was all through my concentration. So in COVID, like a big project for me was right, how how can I work on my concentration? You know, you know, if you mental game, like how can you work on that? So, you know, looking up ways for me, um, how I can stay engaged. Because as you say, you know, you don't want to be getting to, you know, even extra time, you know, if you're in a, a playoff game, you know, extra time penalties, that's a long time. And you know, you, you can't get to extra time and just think, you know, and you've got nothing left in you mentally. You know, so that that was a big thing, and and I do think that it has helped me. Um, yeah. Great yeah. Point. By the way, we, we we got a question right here from uh from Christopher Smith, and uh, <laughs> that's, my, that's my that's my uh, a girl that I went well my best friend from from Clemson. That's her dad. Hi, Chris. Oh no way. Hi, Chris. Oh. <laughs> hey, Chris. Um, he goes, hi, Sandy. What suggestions do you for? Do you have for young goalkeepers to build trust with their backs to play through them when they are under pressure, as opposed to playing the ball out and or losing possession? We miss you! Exclamation! Exclamation! <laughs> uh, I miss the Smith family very much too. Um, for me, I think it's like in training. I mean, they're the times that you've got to uh, you've got to practice. I mean, you're going to make mistakes, um, and I think you know, got to you know, I've had times in training where people haven't trusted me and, and you, you know, you have that conversation after training, um, 
you know, in this situation, like I think I was a good option, you know, did you not see me? Did you not hear me? So that's another thing. Are you communicating to your defenders? Um, and I think that's a big thing that young goalkeepers especially can work on in training is building a relationship because you can't just expect a defender to trust you. You know, you've also, you know, you've got to build that relationship, but also show them that they can trust you. And um, yeah, I, I think training and 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 your practice sessions are, are the best time to work on those things. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to let's uh, let's let's get, kind of go back to these clips here because now we're going to get a different scenario right here. So let me pull this this up right here. Is this the same play? Still, all right, all right. Here we go. Okay, so this is the third scenario here. So now we're playing Man U, uh, yeah. Sus Suskia's team, Man U. So. <laughs> Uh, plays a through ball from midfield that kind of beats the back line right here. Um, you kind of recognize this trigger of the pass and that the angle is such that your line cannot get to the ball. So you come off the line and clear quickly. You make that decision right here to clear, come off quick and just get rid of it on that chase right there, which I, I think is the right decision. Absolutely. You know, see, you know. Um, I think so many young goalkeepers, you know, they, they think that they have to build, 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 build. And you're like, nope, this is a dangerous situation. Route one, let's let's get rid of it. So kind of what do you see first off right here? Um, I think I don't know who I think that's our centre back. So first, I mean, our centre back is at halfway challenging for that ball. And so she's been pulled way out of position, you know, so straight away, if she gets beaten. You know, what's our cover, you know? Our right back's pretty wide, you know, she'll need to start tucking back in. And then our other centre back is left 1v1. So straight away, if once our centre back at halfway gets beaten, you've got to, you know, maybe creep a few yards on your front foot for that through ball. Um, I mean, going back to what I said earlier about let defenders defend, you know, the complete <laughs> opposite end of that scale is you've got to be the one to make that decision, you know. You know, I've been in moments this season where a through ball's come in, I've come and dealt with it, and my centre back said, Oh, you know, I could have, you know, I could have got that ball. You know, so you've also, you know, let defenders defend, but in a situation like this, situation like this, if you're going to take control, you've got to take control of the situation. You can't leave any doubt. And so I think it's easy as keepers, well, I think it's easy for anyone, you know, when you're kind of like, Oh, is it you? Is it me? And you're kind of in that limbo. Um you know, that's I think that's one thing I've probably fell a bit guilty of last season is leaving my defenders to do it too much. So um for me, like this season has been a real big thing, you know, just taking control of those situations. Yeah, well, and I think you could see like I think for goalkeepers out there you could see. And I agree with you, like a, a lot of younger goalkeepers and stuff will get into that situation where they they're like, Oh, I was gonna come, but oh maybe I should stay or oh and that immediately like first of all you know recognize once you commit to that to this situation you have to go you have to go call it clear it and everything you don't want to get caught in no man's land you don't want to say oh well the defender's beating me i'll back off and now what are they going to do they have pressure coming on their back you're kind of close to them they're going to touch you the ball because they can't go anywhere else with it you know they're at full sprint running towards the goal so to take control of this situation is is exactly what to do um, and you're, and you're, you know, and then defenders out there, you know, keep the other people, keep the attackers off your keeper. <laughs> like, cause we see that way too many times too, that the defenders are like, oh, she's got it. And then, the, then you're under pressure from the attacker, but you know, well done. No, I, and I no, I love the fact that defenders are still there in a support in a, in a supporting role, recognizing you're going to take control. You're going to be, you're, you're, you know, you're going to be. And it's important that she blocks. Um, she blocks the oncoming attacker, even just that little, like, you know, pick gives you more time and somebody's not just running right on to you. So. Yeah. No. And, and, and also I think, you know, one, one last thing I kind of want to bring up is for a lot of young, young players to see this right here, look at the, you, you got to look at the pace and you got to look at the weight of that ball too. Like based on the weight of that ball and, and how that ball, where that ball is moving away from your defender right there. Like chances are that they're going to have to, they're going to have to be they're going to, it's going to, it's going to be two steps to get to that ball and you can get there in one. So, you know, what's, you're going to leave that situation and getting that two steps allows time for that player to get more engaged. And, 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 and I mean, the chances are they could potentially win that ball. Now you're in a really disadvantageous situation. So, I mean, I think again, just overall well done, you know? 
Sandy's like, oh, these all these clips are great of me. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for all the goals I've conceded next. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've scolded Mike about putting those up in the past. Oh, man. <laughs> but a lot of goalkeepers, you know, when we have put those up before in the past, they actually get excited. They go like, oh, no, I, I want to see those. I want to break those down. and I want to help people learn from from my mistakes type of thing. Um, yeah, that's a good point. All right, let's. Let's go to this play while uh, while Suskia right now is a uh, is turned into a, an avatar. Um, I want to go. Uh, I'm guessing the dogs are going crazy. Um, I want to go here and uh, this play right here. It's I think it's against Man U as well too. I think there's pressure at the sideline right here. So let's kind of start it right here. Um, yeah, there's pressure at the sideline um, the, by a midfielder, and you can they play the ball negative. And then kind of keeping shape of the line, it's still being the shape is still there. You kind of come up, step high to receive the pass, and then you move laterally to kind of create that space and and the field to allow your players to kind of widen the field, and then you can just play comfortably short right there, um, allowing your guys to b build out. Um, let's kind of walk through this here. So, kind of, what's your thinking here at this point right here? Um, well, I think. My stance is quite deep, but then once I realise that our centre back is in possession, you know, you need to make that pass an easier, shorter pass. Um, and you know, just because just because we're goalkeepers and you know your 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 starting position is behind the back line, it, it doesn't mean you can never step high. I mean, we've you know even with a two, sometimes with a three centre-backs, you know, I've kind of stepped in and, and been that extra centre-back just to create mm -hmm. width and, and and make the formation a bit more expansive. So I don't think, you know, any goalkeeper, you know, never think like you can't, if there's space, you know, step into that space, you know, make, you know, our centre-back and, and right-back can now really, really get wide. Um, yeah. See, and I love that you shift the and you, and you shift the ball. So you shift you shift the positioning of the ball when you receive it. You take that touch interior, allowing. So I think this is just great right here. And again, you know, it looks simple because you just you know a lot of young goalkeepers say, well, she just passed the ball to the player next to her, but she didn't. She didn't. She she scanned the field. She looked at her options, and she realized that's a great decision right here in order for us to you know, move to that next spot, you know, and, and Suski, I know that's something that you've brought up to so many young goalkeepers. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> like, I, think, I think that was a rhetorical question. Mike. I, like, I sometimes do that. I sometimes, Are you look, I'm having these, question? I'm having these pains on my side right now. Like, I don't know what's going I don't on. Really think, I think you answered the question. You just said, Saski, you're agreeing with me, right? <laughs> Dude, one of the things I, um, I think from the last again that you showed clips, actually, one of the things we looked at, or I think it was mentioned at halftime in that game, you know, so our manager really wants us to switch the ball across the back line, you know, a couple of times and then, you know, make the point of attack. And, you know, if I've stepped a bit higher and I'm in between the centre backs, so I'm just a little bit deeper, you know, if we switch the ball a couple of times, you might get the ball from the left centre back and you open it up to go to the right centre back. And you'll see in front of you their ten outfield players suddenly shift yeah. across as well. If you see them shift across, that's why sometimes I like to take a few extra touches if I know they're going to shift because then suddenly you can hit them. And if you can drive that passing back to the other fullback, you know your team's out. So I think you know if you are you know a goalkeeper, a team that likes to play in possession, always be watching the opposition what they're doing because you know. It's a great, it's a great start to change the attack. Yeah. Yeah. Um. By the way, there's a there's a there's a funny thing right here, and I kind of want to throw this up here because I, I think this is a, a this is a fun uh -oh. question right here. Yeah. Uh, th this young man right here, uh, Taylor Tellez, uh asks Sandy, "What was the happiest moment of your career?" And I just got to throw that up there. Um. That's a good question. I think probably um when we went to the under twenties World Cup. Back in 2018, I mean, for me, like being part, I think there's what 21 players. There's one of the first and probably few teams I've ever been on, um, where everybody just got on. I mean, it's so. I mean, you don't need to get on in, in you know in in this time to win things, but I mean, it was just off the pitch, such a 
such a nice and, and, and good team to be a part of. And I think also in that tournament, we had in qualifying in the Euros the year before, we had severely underperformed. I mean, we I mean, we scraped through World Cup qualifying. I think uh France hosted the tournament. So that year there was actually an extra an extra spot to qualify. Um and, and we fortunately beat Scotland and then to come away with the bronze medal from that. I mean, I think for me personally, that just really capped off my youth career and and to do it part of a team that like I genuinely just got on so with everybody was it was yeah I mean I don't think I could have asked for a better tournament to be honest nice <laughs> Saskia do you want to share yours for Taylor for my yeah oh. <laughs> <laughs> the dust off the memory um I mean everybody will come back to the uh, everybody will come back to the 99 World Cup and obviously the win and stuff but I think that there's so many moments in your career that are so personal like little little achievements like that that would be hard for people to understand like you know being named to that team but the way i was named to the team didn't have to like look at the list going up i got called in separately and was new like three months ahead of time that's the first time it ever happened to me in my 10-year career like instead of waiting to the last minute like there are little moments in your career that are the best and um that have sometimes nothing to do with the game on the field either yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I would say my happiest moment was uh, was uh, when I I played a scrimmage against Jurgen Klinsmann and I shut him down. I mean, he was like fifty, <laughs> but still. Hey, I get it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, my um, <laughs> certainly not my happiest moment was actually my last Clemson game. I don't know if you were there, Saskia, but um, we played UCLA. I think it must have been like the second round, and it was like my second round of the NCA uh, tournament. I and it was there. my last game. <laughs> It was, I was been back there. in 2019, <laughs> and it was my last game as a senior. We'd we'd got through the first round, you know, dramatic penalty shootout, you know, and, and you know I've got dreams, you know, we're going to beat UCLA, we're going to get to the College Cup, we're going to do it all in my last year, and and I think within about 15 minutes we were three nil down. It was just not a date to remember. We were losing five nil. I thought, God, I mean, what a sad way to end my college career right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, try losing the ECR mine in the first round this year. So I think, I think I have some seniors that are that are feeling your pain right now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, we don't, uh, we don't, we, we don't want to relive that. We'll just, we'll keep the PTSD to a minimum. Uh, <laughs> no, today, but that's my uh, point. There, there are moments that you never forget. And there are moments in your career. So the happiest moment, like there are personal ones. Like my, I think one of my last professional games um, playing against Atlanta and stopping Charmaine Hooper's penalty kick. Like, I think we, I think we won that game, but I don't even remember if we won that game. Like, but I remember I saved Charmaine Hooper's penalty kick. <laughs> like, and that's like a huge moment for me in my career. So. <laughs> um well well I, I know we want to start wrapping up right here because obviously you know sandy you're you're in the middle of season right now and you probably got to get to bed at a reasonable time and and by and the way the bed. i'm not a manchester united fan for women it was the men's team from when i was younger so i didn't want like i'll root for your team now <laughs> like, i'm kind of like i'm an, now i'll be an everton fan i'm kind of like blank i don't have a favorite right now so now it's okay <laughs> I, I see. I I thought when you're when you're a supporter, you're a supporter through and through for for uh, all their teams. All know. their teams. Well, I mean, Timmy played for Everton also, so that's like, true. You know, and he played for Man U, and so so I can do both. There we go. <laughs> there, uh, there, there, there we go. Um, Sandy, kind of before we we wrap up right here, actually, there's a there's a really good question, you know, right here. Um, and let me see if I can pull that up right here. Oh, how can coaches help uh, prepare players for time off the ball? and staying engaged. Any final thoughts on that? Um, I think we've covered it. <laughs> oh, did we? Okay. No, I don't I'm know. It was saying, in the... I'm saying yeah. if you look back into what we've gone over is how to engage them, work with them in practice, make sure that they're like, um, you know, part of your sessions, build, like, you know, build part of your sessions, incorporate the goalkeepers, use them in rondos, like use them in your meetings. Like don't just isolate them. That is on you as a coach. It's across the board. Yeah. Well, I apologize that I did not get to this question earlier for this person. 
Uh, I forgot to throw it up here on the screen uh, right here. Um, well, honestly, Sandy, I mean, we're going to have to have you back. Uh, this is, was on, yeah, sure. on, on, I mean, you all, the GKIQ have of all of you young goalkeepers is just uh, off the charts. I mean, it's just un, unreal, all, 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 all of you. Um, but, uh, but, but before we go, kind of, if anybody else out, out there, they may, might have some more questions for you or they want to follow you on socials, like where's the best place for them to connect with you? Oh, all the social media. Um, <laughs> can I, like, I can drop my username in the comments. Yeah, can absolutely. Of course. So hopefully I don't leave the podcast again. <laughs> <laughs> let's see what, let's see what happens here. Mike can also throw it up when we um, repost it. Right? Yeah. 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 Not, not yeah. Always. <laughs> I didn't even know you had a Facebook. I was like, I was trying to find you on Facebook to tag you, but I couldn't, uh, I find you. You must have a secret name. So. Yeah, my alter ego. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do have face. I I don't think I've. I Nobody think it's just, uh, exists. Mike, <laughs> we're old. We still use Facebook. <laughs> I know. I know. Sandy, if you want to throw your TikTok up there, feel free. Oh God, no, no, it's not not my kind not, of thing. You're not TikToking it up. <laughs> no, it's the Instagram. Oh, Stick with the Instagram. Yeah, oh, I I leave the other girls in our team to do TikToking. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I... well, <laughs> well, so if you want to reach out to Suskia and <laughs> if you want to reach out to Suskia and her dogs, you can reach out to her at Suskia oh, Chanel's in the background. Yeah, she is. Hello. <laughs> hey, Chanel. I see you. She's not interested. She's, she's not. She she's, wants to go for a walk. There. She wants to go for a walk. Oh, well, then we're, we'll hurry up. Uh, at Suskia underscore Weber on all social medias. You can also find her at Suskia Weber on the Union Sports platform and the Gold Yes, Community yes. Over on the Union Sports. Check that out. www.theunionsports.com. 30 day free trial. Right now, we're in a friends and family trial phase. So please give us your feedback, guys, on what you like, what you don't like uh, on the platform. It's a, Sandy, it's a, it's a community of goalkeepers, uh, for goalkeepers, by goalkeepers, educating, entertaining, and engaging each other. Uh, did I make that succinct enough, Suskia, right there? I thought that was wonderful. I thought that was great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I got a future in ad. Now, reads, guys. what should uh, happen is it should just flash up on the screen. It should go black and it'll say the union. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> the union sports.com. There you go. Day free trial. Guys, it's so worth it. Goalkeepers from all over the world putting up their content um, and the quality content. It's not a truck driving on a field with balls dropping out of the back <laughs> and um, keepers doing breakaways. We promise it's it's um, it's just quality from um, and you can um, interact and engage with um, the content creators and and each other, ask questions and everything. So it's yeah. it's it's an amazing platform. Sandy's like, wow, I got a, I got, there's a there's a there was an ad read for the ACC and for the Union Sports <laughs> all in one sh all in one show all in one show. Oh. <laughs> and I love Everton. it. Um, and Everton and Everton. Um, Guys, remember, if you have, have a guest suggestion or a topic suggestion for us, contact at inside the 18 media. That's the number 18 media.com or at goalkeeper podcast on all social media platforms. Uh, shout out to everybody uh, who's been supporting the show. You guys have been phenomenal. Thanks for everybody who's been putting in your questions. You guys have been incredible. Uh, Sandy, again, thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule. And England, bye to the Smith Everton. family. <laughs> and bye to the Smith family. And, bye to the Smith. <laughs> and, uh, and that's all the time on Inside the 18. And we are out. Later, guys. Yeah!